welcome everybody. Um, my name is Leah Sanchez and I'm the head of programs and outreach at the Textile Museum of Canada. And I'd like to welcome you all to this um, paper making workshop with Jan Emerovsky. This program will run for approximately an hour and a half. Uh, feel free to type in any questions or comments in the chat box. Um, before we begin, even though we're not physically in the museum, I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which the Textile Museum of Canada operates is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. And it's now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work here and through our activities, we seek to create a space for people to share, learn, and celebrate the textile practices of today and long ago in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So I'd like to turn you over now to Jan, who is, I'm going to spotlight on. There you go. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Jan. My pronouns are they, them. I'm education coordinator at the Textile Museum of Canada. Um, and I am excited to be offering you this second installment of our Papers and Petals uh, workshop series. I wanted to do this because I'm an artist. I do textile work and paperwork in combination, and I love flowers. <laughs> so I, I hope you'll, you'll have fun joining me today with this. Um, we're going to be making paper in a couple of different ways. I wanted to provide uh, some instruction for how to make paper if you don't have access to maybe the tools that are normally expected to, to be used for making paper. So if you're just working with things that you can find at home uh, or, or buy more easily than sort of professional tools. Uh, and here we go. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna show you some samples of what I've made at home so far. Um, these are the first samples that I made. These I made um, using a blender to blend all of my scrap paper. Um, and I've got some big chunks of paper and some very, very small chunks that have come together to form sort of a more uniform texture. Um, and they're quite thick, kind of like a, a rag art paper. Um, and I, I adore them. I don't know if the color is, is showing up so well through uh, Zoom, but uh, some of these pink areas are pretty bright for me. This is another example of a paper that I made using pulp blended with a blender. Um, and I have some, some large inclusions of, of paper in there once again. This one's quite thick and it just dried outside. Uh, it's pretty stiff right now. I could iron this and make it a bit more flat. It's kind of wavy now. Yeah. And then here are some examples of paper that I made without using a blender. And I just honestly <laughs> broke up the, the pulp for this paper with my hands. Uh, in the instructions that I provided for this program, I suggested that you could use a mortar and pestle or a potato masher. Um, either of those will work, uh, but they, they will take a long time. And, and you could definitely accomplish sort of smaller chunks of paper to to use for your pulp if you were to beat the pulp with those tools. Um, but I just ripped up this paper with my hands and it stuck together well. Uh, this will be a little bit more fragile than something that's created with uh, pulp using a blender. And that's just because there's still separate pieces of paper in this. So if I were to fold it, some of these might, might come apart a bit more easily than, uh, than this piece of paper would come apart. But it's still beautiful. Uh, the, the cellulose fibers have still locked in with one another and it's still a piece of paper. This one you can see is falling apart a little bit. <laughs> it's still drying. It's got some floral inclusions in it. So some of these will probably fall out um, and we will explore some use of petals in our paper making today. This is another example of uh, a paper made with pulp that I just tore by hand. All right. And if you are going to be making paper um, without a blender, you'll need to uh, have your, your paper soaking for a while before you try to tear it, before you try to beat it with any tools. Um, and that's because it needs to soften prior to that process. 
so that it's easier for the paper to break down. Um, but if you're using a blender, you can kind of just go, go right ahead. Um, this is just a bunch of different scraps of paper that I have. I like using uh, a lot of different types of paper when I'm doing handmade stuff. Um, and that's because I like the textural differences that I'm able to see in the finished work. Um, I like the, the color changes throughout the sheet. And I like to use a variety of thicknesses too. So this is, um, I think this is from a mailer, like a, a postage mailer. It's quite thick and stiff. And then this piece of paper, this is just tissue paper. Uh, it's very fragile, but it has some nice fibers in there. Um, the weight or the thickness of the paper that you tear up to make your handmade paper with is going to determine the uh, structural integrity of the handmade paper that you create. So if you use just tissue paper, um, you, you can certainly do that, um, but you might wanna have a bit more pulp in each page that you pull, a bit more gooey paper gunk in each page that you pull um, to make sure that it's not gonna fall apart because it's gonna be quite fragile. So using a variety of different textures of paper, because I do like the look of, of tissue paper in my handmade stuff, um, using, using a variety of different textures will help all of this stick together and stay together. And I like using a variety of colors too. There's some uh, paper in here that has text printed on it. And some of that's visible in, in the finished paper that I have here because I've left it. That way I, I like the way that it looks. Um, you can cut up your paper, you can rip it up, you can use a ruler to help you rip it. You can use shredded paper. Um, I'll show you one really easy technique for just ripping paper quickly in case that's helpful for you. Um, I'm going to use a ruler and I'm just going to put it against my paper. I'm going to hold the ruler flat against the surface of the table, put some pressure on it, make sure the paper is not going anywhere. I'm going to pull up a little corner of the paper and I'm going to rip it. And you can do that a bunch of times, create some strips and then uh, cut the paper again to make some little squares. Uh, if you're going to be making paper using a blender, you can use quite large uh, pieces of paper and, and just toss them in the blender. Even this kind of size would work. Uh, you just might have to blend it for longer depending on how, how big your, your pieces are. Um, but if you're going to be making paper without a blender, then you're gonna want your pieces to be quite a bit smaller so that uh, your work, you have less work to do <laughs> in breaking down the pulp before you draw some sheets. So I've got a variety of sizes in here and I used this honestly both for putting in the blender and ripping by hand um, because I like to just go for it and see what happens. <laughs> and I'm quite happy with whatever the paper tells me it wants to do. Here's a bunch of paper that I used for this process. I used this napkin, this is from Dollarama. I just like the colors, I like gingham pattern. It's fun. This is tissue paper, gift wrap paper stuff, line paper, some bright neon printer paper, some random printouts that I wasn't going to use for anything. Rip it all up, toss it in your box, toss it in the bowl, use it for paper. Um, I've got a sponge. This will be useful for taking some of the moisture out of the paper once we set it um, so that it will dry quicker. And also it, it helps kind of get the paper off of uh, the mold when you're setting it so that it doesn't tear and fall apart. So a sponge is good to have, or you can use a cloth, just sort of something to absorb moisture. Um, on my surface that I'm gonna be drawing sheets of paper onto, I've just got a towel folded set here there's going to be there's going to be some water it's going to get a little wet um that's just simple there what else have i got here i've got some tape i've got this funny looking tool which is um, a mold and deckle so this is uh, a store-bought mold and deckle that's used for paper making it's going to create a sheet of paper that is this size it's about like a, a photo size um, it consists of two wooden frames. There is mesh on the top of one of the wooden frames. 
So there's a bit of a hollowed out area below that. There's two hinges keeping them together. And then there's just an empty frame. So this part of the frame is called the decal. This acts as like a cookie cutter kind of for your paper. It determines the edges of, of where the, the paper is going to exist. It, it forms the sheet of paper for you. And this is called the mold. It's the side that has the mesh on it. This is where the pulp is going to sit. Uh, the mesh allows for water to drain through uh, so that your pulp can form into a sheet of paper and it isn't a pile of goop anymore. And so you can purchase this or you can make your own. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, yeah. Yes. Sorry, quick question. Um, yes. Can you use glossy paper? So like magazine pages or like gift wrapper or old calendars? For sure, yeah, you definitely can. Uh, mm -hmm. You just wanna use cellulose paper. Um, so that's, that's just about any paper that you can find. Um, <laughs> you don't wanna use plastic, that's not gonna work. You wanna use paper, but if it's magazines, newspaper, um, yeah, gift wrap, that'll all work for sure. Um, so I have a second frame around here somewhere, but I'm going to show you how to make your own mold and decal. So I bought two of these cheap little frames uh, from the dollar store, and they're the exact same size. The other one is around here. <laughs> and then I've got some window screening. Um, so you can buy this at the hardware store, or maybe you can repurpose it from something that you've got at home. Um, but I am just going to uh, adhere this to the surface of my frame to create my mold. Um, and you want for your screening to be the size of the outer rectangle of your frame. You don't want it to be too small so that it's going to uh, have any risk of, of falling within the border of the inner rectangle of the frame. You want it to cover the entire surface so it's going to be secure. You can use a stapler or a staple gun to adhere this to uh, the frame. So if you have just a, a normal stapler, you can open it up and use it flat and push down. Uh, and, and that sort of acts uh, as a replacement for a staple gun. You want to do staples all the way around, securing it, pulling it as tight as you can. Um, if there's little wrinkles, little creases in the window screening, that isn't going to matter too, too much um, because when you set your paper, um, it's going to have the opportunity to lie flat and, and dry flat afterward. Um, I don't have a stapler on hand, so I'm going to use masking tape. Um, I'm using masking tape rather than, or not masking tape, I'm using duct tape. <laughs> Good. I'm using duct tape rather than masking tape um, because this is going to be at least somewhat waterproof. Um, you don't want to use painter's tape. You don't want to use scotch tape because that likely won't withstand um, all of the action that this frame is going to have in the bath of water when we are drying up sheets of paper. So this is going to be pretty sturdy. It's going to keep the mesh in place on our frame and it's not gonna mind the water. And I'm just gonna do four pieces of tape that match the dimensions of my frame and tape it around the edges. And I invite you to please follow along with me if you have these tools with you or, or you can just watch and listen and, and do this later if you'd like. And I'm adhering the mesh to the flat side of my frame. So on this picture frame, there's, I need to orient myself with this camera here. There's a flat side, and then there's a side that has a sort of indent with an inner layer here. I don't want to touch that side. I want to go for the flat side. I'm pulling on the mesh a little bit to keep it taut against the frame. And then last one, she looks beautiful. Uh, 
There you go, that's done. Okay, so this was in the fridge. I just tore these pieces of paper and submerged them in water to be soaking so they can soften up for the paper making process. It doesn't really matter how much water you use as long as all of the paper is covered. Generally, throughout all of this process, the more water, the easier it is to do any of this um, within reason so that you're not being wasteful. Um, but the exact ratios of this aren't, aren't so consistent, aren't so specific, especially because um, every time you, you draw a piece of paper, it might be a little different, especially if you're using like a bunch of different scrap papers. Every piece is going to be quite unique. So experimentation is the way to go with this. This is nice and soft, comes apart pretty easily, even those tough pieces. Got some text in there. It's a nice soup. It's a weird smoothie. I'm showing you my basins of water now too. Okay, so this one I used earlier, this one I used for making this paper that I uh, did without the use of a blender. So I'll show you a bit of that now. Um, it's got some uh, floral inclusions in it right now. Um, you don't have to do anything to prepare the petals that you're going to be working with. If you're gonna include them in your paper, you can just add them into your pulp water. Um, I just took the petals off of the flower and threw them in. So I'm gonna do that same thing now. You can use dried flowers or fresh flowers. Um, dried flowers, you really don't have to worry about at all. They're likely gonna be pretty flat uh, and they're gonna stick in there nice and solid. For fresh flowers, one thing that you should at least be cognizant of if this matters to you, um, the pigment from the petals might bleed into your paper uh, when it's all wet and sitting together. And so some people like that look and, and seek that out. Some people might not like that look, but that's something to consider. There are some processes that you can uh, put the, the flowers through to uh, prepare them so that they won't bleed into your paper, a uh, process called blanching in which you boil the petals prior to uh, using them. Um, but this blanching process, it also strips the petals of some of their pigment. Um, so you, you kind of have to decide what's more important to you. Do you want petals that aren't gonna bleed? Do you want more vibrant colors? And just experiment as much as you can. Uh, you can also add inclusions that are not natural materials. You can use a bunch of yarn and cut it up. Maybe I'll do some of that now just to show you. I've got a ball of yarn. I'm just going to take some and cut little pieces. That'll go into the paper. Doesn't matter how big they are, really. Um, you just want to make sure when you're drawing your pages of paper, if you've got inclusions in your pulp, you want to make sure that some pulp is covering at least a small area of each inclusion so that it's got something to cling on to. Um, because the, the cellulose fibers of the paper, when they dry together, that's what's going to, that's what's going to hold everything together is the, the little tiny little fibers that they have in them. Um, so making sure that there's some cellulose fiber covering all of your inclusions is going to help them stick in there. So we've got a nice confetti bath. Looks fun. I'm going to add some more pulp in there from uh, the paper that was sitting in my fridge overnight. And I'm just going to rip it up and, and toss it in as I go. When you are creating this sort of bath of pulp to pull pages from, you want to have enough water that your mold and decal can pass easily into it and still have some water over top of the surface of the mold and decal when it's sitting in there. 
And that's because you need to have enough room to go underneath the pulp to then pull it up, becoming a page of paper. Um, so that's why the, the amount of water in here is what it is and, and matters. Um, it doesn't <laughs> matter specifically that the ratio, uh, you can do as much water as you want with as little pulp as you want. Uh, you just need enough water to have the pulp float above the molding deckle to be able to get at it. And um, you do want to make sure to keep any pulp that you're not using at the moment in the fridge or it's going to go moldy. It's going to smell terrible. Just a warning. <laughs> Um, you could keep it for a few days, maybe like a week max in the fridge. Often um, when I'm making paper, I'll have some pulp left over at the end in my sort of basin. That's not really enough to pull a page from and I'll keep that in the fridge until I'm ready uh, to make another round of pulp and, and add that to the new pulp. And keep going. And we're ready. All right. One more thing that I did not mention yet is that whenever you are pulling a sheet of paper and you're setting it, you're going to want to set it onto a little piece of fabric. So it can just be a little cutout of scrap fabric, something absorbent. I've just got um cotton rags that I'm using that cut up. Um, so these are often referred to as pelons. You can get like a professional sort of material that's referred to as pelon for this process. Um, but I'm just using cotton rags because it works fine. Um, they are a bit larger than the sheets of paper that I'm going to be pulling. Uh, you want some room to be able to hold it. Uh, and your paper is going to dry on this surface and it is going to peel off of this quite easily afterward. Um, the paper might take, honestly, it might take a day to dry. <laughs> if it's a sunny day, it might take maybe a couple hours uh, and you leave it outside, uh, it might take a couple hours. If it, you're leaving it to dry inside on a flat surface, it, it might take overnight, it might take a day to dry. Um, so it's up to you where you leave it to dry, but you're gonna wanna leave it on a piece of fabric. Um, got my pill on got my bag, I've got my mold and decal, and we're gonna go. So we're gonna do a nice submerge. We're gonna do a bit of a swoop in there. We're gonna shake it around, kind of play with where the, where the pulp is going over top of the mold. Um, and you can kind of edit it too once you pull it out of the water a bit see how much of it it's filling up. I can see from what I have going on here that there's still some spaces in my sheet of paper that have not been covered with pulp. So maybe I actually want some more pulp in here, but I can also edit this by hand. And to do that, I wanna put it back in the water just a little bit so that my pulp can be submerged, can be affected by the water, can be sort of rearranged, shimmied around just in the very top of the water there and fill in the holes. This is a cheater version, but it works fine. Uh, it works fine, especially if you're okay with the textured paper. If you're going for a thinner, more uniform paper, then, well, first of all, your, your, your pulp is probably gonna be a lot thinner and more uniform, but, uh, and you, you know what? You probably wouldn't run into the same problem with all of these uh, holes forming in your paper. It, it, would, it would sit more uniform anyway when you pull up the sheet. Uh, so this is the cheater version for people who like to make thick paper with lots of stuff in it. This is like confetti birthday cake, recycling bin paper. All right, that looks good to me. And then I'm going to brush all of this stuff off of my deckle here and put it back in, in the bath. Um, 
so if it'll leave my fingers just off of the edges, make sure I'm not wasting that. Okay, and then this uh, this store-bought mold and decal, it has hinges attaching the mold to the decal, and that is not my favorite thing. Um, I like it when they're separate. I find it easier to use, but maybe you find them attached easier to use because then you don't have to hold the deco in place over top of the mold when it's in uh, the back. Uh, you can use two elastics instead of hinges to, to hold your mold and deco together if you put an elastic over here, an elastic over here, to be able to submerge it together and then remove them when you're taking the deco off. That works. But these ones are attached and they don't open quite flat. Um, but that's OK. We'll, we'll find a way around it. So I'm going to set this down here for a second. Some people, when they're doing this part of the process, when they're setting the page onto uh, the pellon to dry, they take their mold and they flip it. Um, and I find that to be risky. I find that to be very risky, especially when I've got all of this going on. Uh, so my safer way of doing that is to put the pellon directly over top of the piece of paper, sort of press it down a little bit, so that I know it's on there. I know it's not going to go anywhere. I know that my paper exists underneath this pellon. And then I'm going to flip it that way. And I'm going to, because I've got these hinges here, I'm going to have the hinges sitting off the side of the table so that I can have my mold directly against the surface of the table. And then I'm going to take my sponge and I'm going to try and get some of that moisture out of there. This will, yeah, it'll it'll speed up the drying process for the paper and it'll also help the paper come apart from the netting of the mold. Kind of squeeze out any water, not much water. Uh, you can also use a cloth if you don't have a sponge for this part. And I think I think it's ready to be peeled off. So now And take the mold off of there. And that's a piece of paper right there. It's beautiful. Um, and that is ready to dry just like that. I would probably just carry this out, put it on the table in the sun, or you can leave it inside. Um, I've seen people hang them. If you've got little clips, you can attach this to a hanger or a clothesline. It's going to stay somewhat, <laughs> might start peeling as it's drying. You can experiment. If it doesn't work for you, flat surface works all right. Um, you can also press this paper while it's wet. You could put uh, another towel on top of here and have a nice heavy book or something on top of it. You can get a paper press. Um, I like to have a bit of texture in the paper, so I'm going to leave it without pressing because I, I like the way it looks without that. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that the texture of whatever you're using as a pellon and whatever you're using as netting in your mold are going to affect the texture of the surface of the paper. Um, and I'll try and show you an example of that. Um, let's see if we have that one. This one does. I don't know if you'll be able to pick up on that in Zoom world. Um, but the texture here is the same as the texture of the surface of this pellon that I'm using. Um, and I don't mind that, um, but that might determine or it might help determine what cloth you use, choose to use for this process. And then on this side, I can see um, the sort of grid of, of the DIY mold and deco that I use. And I'm not sure if you can pick up on that, but a little, me, bit. A little bit. All right. Yeah. It looks like a woven textile to me. Yeah, yeah, it's so pretty. So yeah. beyond the front and the back are slightly different, right? They are, yeah. Yeah, it comes out. Different pieces of paper yeah. making it up and it, it's quite thick. Too. So yeah. cool, yeah. Um, so some questions, will the color stay that bright when it dries? No, it will not. Um, so this is soaked and then this, is oh yeah, because it's dry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
So it's still got bright colors. It's brighter in person than it is on Zoom, mm -hmm. um, but not as bright as when it's wet. Yeah. yeah. Could and you use, sorry, go ahead. You go ahead, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, Dan is just asking if you can use linen for the pelon. Yes, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Linen might give uh, an even more prominent uh, grid structure in the in the surface. The uh -huh. The paper, um, but that could be lovely. Yeah. Oh, and what is the word again? Sorry. So that cloth you have under what? What's the term? Pelon. P e l o n. I think it's l l o n. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, other people, other folks use like uh, just the word felt to refer to this. The uh -huh. Felts for paper making. Mm. Yeah, but it, it really can be any uh, cloth that is absorbent. <laughs> All right, I've got this blender. Um, I recommend if you are going to be using a blender for paper making that you use a blender exclusively for crafting, that you do not use it for food. You can still use it for food if you want to clean it really well. Um, mm, yeah, <laughs> so I, I would recommend like buying a blender from a thrift shop or something that um, Maybe it's old, maybe it doesn't work as well as a new one does, but it'll work great for paper making. Um, so I've got this one that I use just for paper. And I'm going to throw some, some of these guys in there. And the ratio, once again, it doesn't, it doesn't completely really matter as long as all, is the, all of the paper is submerged in water. It's going to be all right. And you can always add more water to it too. So I've got a bit of a random selection of colors and textures here. Um, let's find out if I have enough water. That was my drinking water. And now <laughs> I'm actually going to add some of this uh, water from this basin, because why not? So this is all random, the amount of water. Yeah, um, okay. some people say use twice the amount of water as you do paper, um, but you know it doesn't have to be that. <laughs> it depends uh, on the blender too, right? Some blenders are pickier than others. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and you can also like you can blend the paper in batches if it's not working well for you. You can add more water if it's not working well for you. Um, and two, your, your pulp doesn't have to be perfect coming out of the blender. Um, you can add more water in the basin afterward. Um, I'm going to blend this off camera in the corner of my room. Um, and I'm going to mute myself for that. So I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, so that's done. Um, I just did like a pretty quick pulse of the blender on high, and there is quite a, a thin pulp actually going on here. That will give a pretty uniform uh, sheet of paper with some larger inclusions too, which is fun. I'm gonna throw that in there. We got pulp for days. Rip up some of the huge ones. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, Jan, the paper mm -hmm. doesn't need to be pre soaked for the blender? No, no, you can go right into it with the blender um, because the knife is doing all the work in the blender. It yeah. doesn't really need to sit beforehand. Okay. Yeah, the purpose of, of uh, having it sit before is just to make it softer, break it down so that it's easier to uh, beat with a tool. But the knife is powerful. Mm -hmm. Others asking, what do you use your handmade paper for? Ooh, I like stitching into it. Um, 
I'll show you an example of like a little card that I made as a sample for us today. But um, I I like <laughs> I like making I guess art objects with paper. Um, so just like stitching little illustrations and text into them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'd love to make a quilt out of handmade paper. That's a dream that I have. Um, and, and not necessarily a quilt in the traditional sense because the seams would probably fall apart, but yeah. like a collage version of a quilt, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Order of things. Put, yeah. put this mold down. We put the pelon on top. Gonna flip it. Gonna get my sponge here. This one has more water in it. Okay. And then that came clean off. Wow. So let's put these two beside each other to compare what they look like when they're not dry yet. I'm gonna make sure that this doesn't fall off the table. <laughs> so this one, you can see the different papers that make it up more clearly than here in most cases. And here, there's a lot more brown um, from little fibers that have separated themselves from these thicker papers that have become the sort of overarching, I don't know, the base, I guess. I've got some. It's not very pretty, but <laughs> I just need to get my video going here. All right. like <laughs> my results of my tearing. It's Karin here. There it is. I've spotlighted it. Spotlighted. <laughs> yeah. It looks very thorough. It looks very consistent in texture. Yeah. Nice. It's, uh, I did the pulp in the blender before we started. Nice. Nice. So it's an ex I'm going to try some petals next. Lovely. Let us know how it goes. I will. <laughs> <laughs> um, I brought this little sample that I made to show you how I might make like a, a simple handmade card with this. Um, so this is handmade paper that I did. And then I cut the, the raw edges off of the sheet. So this is like what used to be the edge. Um, I used um, scissors just to cut this, and um, I have washi tape as borders. <laughs> I colored it. So yeah. Margaret says um, she's been using the pour method. It's a bit different, but that's what's available to me, hand pulped. I let my paper soak four days. It helped with the pulping. Also found just rubbing it between my hands helped break down the fibers but the blender would be better. They also put some sari silk in one of their test pieces. Oh, lovely. How did... So, Jan, would it be possible to, like, sort of have a stamp? Like, I mean, like, use uh, embossed. So, like, if you have that material and then you squash it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can... Also, embossed. Yeah. 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 Um, I can try that, too, with, like, you could use a button or something. Uh -huh. Something small and somewhat flat and have your paper dry over top of that object. Yeah. And it will, yeah, it'll dry in that shape. You know what, you could also do something sculptural too, like um, here. Mm. 
if I had this and I set my sheet of paper over top of it to dry, yeah. being careful to not have it rip, I guess, uh, if that were important to me, mm -hmm. uh, it would dry in that shape. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I have a question. Um, how do you know when you've soaked enough of the excess water out? Uh, when you're setting the paper? Um, yeah. I guess one of the signs is that you, if you start to notice that the paper is separating itself from the mold, uh, then that means it's ready to go. Um, but I would just, try and keep going until no water comes out of your sponge um, when you're soaking up from the back of the comb. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Thanks. You're welcome. That's not coming off so easy, so I'm going to try and press into it a little harder and maybe wipe the back, see if that helps. Add it with my fingers. Nice. And if, uh, if you want to press them under like a heavy book or something, you can pile all the pylons together. And that's what you, that's what you do when you're using a paper press as well. You can pile the pylons like that um, to get all the water out once they're pressed together. Uh, and then I would put one last pylon there and then squish it down with a heavy book. Okay, I'm gonna put some uh, paper in the blender and try and make it a little bit more fine and see what happens with that. So I'm gonna mute myself for that and I'll be right back. The pulp that I just blended looks a lot like a smoothie. And it definitely needs more water. <laughs> it really looks like a smoothie. Yeah, it's got kind of like this pink color too. Yeah. So it's not going to be completely uniform because I'm adding it to some of my previous pulp, but it'll definitely change the overall texture, the paper that comes out. And yet, some words got in there.
Divination, yeah. It says, Y is a. <laughs> Don't know. Wow, very different from the other ones. Let's see. So this is a previous one. Also blended, right? Like also with the blender, but yeah. Less. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to unmute myself. This this is, uh, I don't know, can you see? Oh, there it is, yes. Yeah. But, um, I used mostly for the pulp watercolor paper, uh, just leftover bits and pieces, uh, some of it with paint on it and some not. And then I took a little... Uh, phrase from a card that I tore apart and just embedded it in there. Wow. Yeah, okay. lots of interesting things. There are some threads and little pieces of tissue and so forth. But, you know, all in all, I'm, uh, I'm quite happy with the results. That's beautiful. I yeah. love the way you've done the inclusion there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you could get into some some deep collage. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, really yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Janet, did you want to show? Hang on. It's a yeah, little dark. Yeah, it's a little yeah. dark. There's a highlight in here, but um, it's multicolored um, mm -hmm. paper samples and um, catalogs and stuff. Yeah. But, I put the I put some leaves and petals on the um, the other side, so you can't. I won't see them till I this drive. When I turn it over, I'll see the petals and leaves on the other side. Yeah, that'll be a fun reveal. Nice. Yeah. Mm. And when I put tiny, tiny little, I mean, and I mean tiny pieces of scrap fabric um, cut from like remnants of quilting projects. So tiny, tiny little triangles of fabric. I can show you. Um, this is how small they are. Wow. And so that's an idea like to color it up. But um, I'm wondering if mine turned out very gray, but I think when it dries, it'll be um, less gray. It'll lighten up a bit. For sure. Mm -hmm. The background. So would you save the rest of that, Jan? Like the water, would you take out the pulp and set it aside and use it again or? I would strain out some of the water mm -hmm. um, and then keep maybe like half of the water along with the pulp and put it in a Tupperware container and keep it in the fridge and use it okay. again. Yeah. Um, the, next, uh, the next installment of Papers and Petals is going to be book binding. Um, so, I'm going to invite you to bring some of your handmade paper to use in that workshop if you'd like. Um, we're going to be doing just some introductory bookbinding um, learning. We're going to make some pamphlets. We're going to learn some saddle stitches. Um, and it's going to be fun. I hope you'll join us. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.